The lecture forms part of a series with the overall title The Odyssey of Self-Transformation, held at the headquarters of the Theosophical Society, 50 Gloucester Place, London, in the spring and summer of 1997. This particular one took place on Sunday, May the 18th, was entitled Spiritual Alchemy Through the Elements, and was given by Yanis Pittis. The program notes summarize its contents thus. The mysterious science of alchemy practiced in the Egyptian temples will be explained, and practical suggestions given as to transmuting base metals into gold. It was said that this could only be accomplished by sprinkling a special powder onto crude metals, which instantly transmuted them into a higher precious form. When dissolved in wine, it was the medicine of the gods with power to cure disease. Knowledge of the special powder was imparted to selected alchemists. Can we begin the work of transmutation now? The symbolic meaning of the elements will be explained and practical application given. Yanis Pittis has been interested in esoteric matters since he was a young person and has studied the tarot and the Kabbalah for the last two decades. He has been a member of the TS for many years. He is head of the Philolithia Esoteric School, which has branches in London and at a number of locations throughout the rest of Europe. The talk begins in a few seconds. Thank you very much. I hope that uh, your great uh, presentation uh, uh, will be um, justified for the, by the end of the, <laughs> of the night. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming, and I hope that by the end of the day you will be as, as keen to follow up the science and to take up the practices that are suggested as you have been keen in actually coming to listen to the talk. Uh, sp spiritual alchemy alludes to the great uh, science and art practiced very powerfully in the ancient Egyptian times. As the word itself, alchemy, suggests, uh, A-L or E-L, the prefix meaning God or uh, divine, and Chem meaning really the esoteric or ancient uh, name of uh, Egypt. So alchemy, the name itself, suggests the divine science of ancient Egypt. Now, ancient Egypt goes far, much further into the antiquity than we actually think or science of our current times tells us. They only put it down to 10,000 years or maybe 15,000 years ago. But uh, ancient Egypt goes back to many more thousands of years. We might even say millions of years. For humanity has been upon this planet, uh, not in uh, decades of uh, thousands of years, but millions of years, yes? So, essentially, this spiritual science, which the Egyptian priests practiced, was the means and the way by which they attained that which we all, whether we know it or not, aim to attain in our evolution journey, passing through this revolving door of incarnation and discarnation of life. The ancient Egyptian culture was one of the greatest and the highest, and it reached a very, very high level of uh, civilization as well as arts and sciences. They were performing ceremonies and rituals that were truly attended by great beings of a uh, higher order, whether we call them divas, angels, or archangels. And so their ceremonies were not as our current ceremonies, pompous, full of regalia, but empty of light, empty of charge, empty of energy. Their ceremonies were truly full of energy, full of light, and full of uplifting vibrations for all of their people. This was the great time of the ancient Egyptian before, of course, the decay set in uh, through familiarity and through uh, various other psychological qualities that we will be talking about uh, throughout the course of this uh, talk. The pyramids were the places where these great uh, initiations and occult ceremonies and rituals were taking place. Unlike what others believe, the pyramids were not uh, burial grounds, but rather places of initiation, places of great spiritual work. 
and anyone who has studied ancient Egypt in great detail, such as Mada Blavansky and Paul Branton and uh, Anne Atwood and various others, will confirm the fact that indeed the pyramids were in the very, very earliest pyramids, great solar furnaces which generated appropriate atmospheres upon this planet for those entities that came from another planet or from another solar system, I should say, so that they were serving this planetary logos, this living planet in which we live, breathe, and have our being, which required some assistance several million years ago. And these beings came and used the pyramid as solar furnaces to anchor the kind of atmosphere that they needed here so that they may do the work of anchoring the spiritual energies upon this planet to accelerate the evolution of the planet and all its organic life. Subsequently, of course, uh, this uh, uh, civilization or these beings withdrew and then the Mediterranean people and other kind uh, of uh, human uh, incarnate souls moved into that area and as they were inspired by the so-called astralite and all that remained within it, then they also took up the inspiration and built the pyramids. The great pyramids are actually under those pyramids that we actually see today. And although these pyramids that we see today most of the time are trampled by tourists and uh, are used as uh, uh, you know, Americans or English or Greeks going there and saying, oh, I've been to the pyramids and getting pictures and video cameras. And for those brave ones that can actually uh, endure the crawl up the very narrow passages, they may have a sense of uh, some kind of a presence felt when they enter the uh, king's chamber. But for most people, really, the pyramids is just another old ruin like the Parthenon or like the Taj Mahal or any other building of uh, real value in the world. But for those who know, even today, great students find their way during the hours of the night in, the, in these uh, old ruins and thereby uh, receive great instruction as far as their spiritual journey is concerned from that branch of the great white brotherhood that has its anchor still in the, that part of the world that we call Egypt. And so perhaps uh, you may read various books, uh, uh, whether they be of uh, Branton of Blavansky or Besant or any of the other great theosophical uh, contributors, and there you will find allusions and attributions to that uh, uh, branch of the brotherhood that is in ancient Egypt, which still today is very alive and very vibrant and takes uh, a very deep interest in the spiritual awakening of this Aquarian age. The spiritual alchemy was resurrected again during the time of uh, the Middle Ages by individual pioneering souls, uh, and they said from time to time that they were visited by great uh, beings, adepts or masters. And these masters or great adepts gave them some special powder. And this special powder, when it was actually uh, sprinkled upon uh, wine, it said that this wine became the medicine of the gods that actually cured all diseases and turned all that is corruptible into incorruptible. And you might also read the epistles of St. Paul, and there you will find that uh, St. Paul also speaks about the process by which that which is uh, mortal may dress the immortal and that which is corruptible may dress the incorruptible, become incorruptible. And all of these are simply allusions to some inner powerful suggestion of spiritual work. As an example, they also speak about the journey or the search for the Philosopher's Stone. What is the Philosopher's Stone? This, the same stone that is uh, looked for and searched by the Tibetans, the same stone which uh, the Lord Christ said to Peter as Petros, which is the Greek word meaning stone, upon which he will build his church. The same stone which the Freemasons call the rough ashla, which when polished becomes the very cube, the very stone upon which they build their inner temple or lodge the same stone which the Tibetans call the diamond jewel, or the Hindus call Om Mani Padmeham, which means the jewel in the lotus. 
that great thousand petal uh, crown of a center of energy upon the head of human beings, which when consciousness is raised up to that level, certainly the goal is reached. Certainly that philosopher's stone is attained. And so gold and base metals and masters and uh, special powder, all of these are simple terms which are used to veil inner realities. Throughout all the ages there have been a way of preserving that which is of value, that which is important from the profane and from the ignorant. The biblical way was to uh, speak in terms of parables and allegories. The Freemasons use uh, the tools and uh, the whole uh, uh, language that belongs with builders. And so they use the building terms and the building uh, uh, tools which any builder will use to build a house or a, uh, a church or whatever. But by those terms, they refer to inner aspects or faculties of the human being. They refer to inner spiritual events that take place along the journey of evolution. And so the search for the philosopher's stones, it's nothing else other than the journey or quest for spiritual perfection or for attainment of that which we call union, of that which we call enlightenment, of that which we call being at one with the God imminent or God transcendent. So essentially, base metals also is a symbol. A symbol of what? A symbol of that which we, in our own nature, have as base raw materials which we may call our passions, our lower nature, our angers, our jealousies, our uh, hates, our fearfulness, our prides, and so on. These are the base metals which when this special powder, which nothing else other, it's nothing else other than spiritual knowledge or spiritual wis wisdom is applied upon it, then they become transmuted and transformed into their higher counterparts of love, compassion, humility, love of one's brother, love of one's God, love of one's children, and so on. So throughout the ages of man, whether we talk of the uh, Gnosis of the Christians, or we talk of the Hindu uh, religion, or we talk of Masons, or we talk of uh, Tibetans, or alchemists, the same principles were veiled by an outer phenomenon of, or an outer language or an outer parable or an outer allegory. And these allegories concealed the inner truths. The Pythagoreans also did exactly the same. They spoke about the outer senses, which deal with material things and perceive material things which they called the irrational senses, because they always lead you to illusions. They lead you to falsehood. But then they also spoke of those veiling the inner rational faculties of the spiritual soul through which the human being was able to perceive reality as is and not as it appears to be through one sense or another of the outer. And so throughout all of these teachings, the message is that it is not possible by the outer faculties to perceive the inner realities. It is not possible by the outer faculties to perceive the inner realities. And however hard one will try to use the outer faculties, i.e., the concrete mind, the lower mind, is not possible for it to actually see that which the higher mind knows. The lower passions cannot touch that which truly the higher emotions are united with. The lower desires only lead us to pleasures which ultimately lead to pain. They only lead us to temporary joys which ultimately lead us to sorrows. For pleasure and pain and joy and sorrow are in time and as time is a transient thing, therefore they also pass away. And if we have something that is pleasurable, it is in time, it will pass, and we will have pain because we have lost a pleasurable thing. And if we have 
a painful experience, this is also in time and it will come to pass and then we will have the pleasure of a painful thing having passed away. And so that which is transient, that which is of the base desires, that which is of what it can be perceived by the lower mind, is the outer phenomena of life. But if we want to go beyond the outer phenomena of life, we must essentially seek a way and find it, as the Christ said, I am the way, the life, and the truth. And this way, the life, and the truth is the same as that which the spiritual alchemists followed. The way is really the quest for perfection, the path to enlightenment. The truth is that essential means and teachings and natural laws which the alchemists call the special formulas. You can only really turn base metals into gold or into their higher counterparts if you had the special formulas. Having the special formulas means having the essential teachings and practices and knowledge of the appropriate laws which govern all things. For if you know the laws that govern all universal manifested life, then by the laws you can actually bring about transmutations and transformations. It is essential to realize that all that we call miracles, all that we see that happens and we call it a magnificent and explainable thing. If you look in uh, uh, the TV in the about 11 o'clock at night, they have the unexplained and all manner of phenomena go on and various scientists put forward their suggestions of how they happen. But science, because it has focused most of its time the attention upon the outer material, gross material side of life, cannot really perceive the inner realities and the inner natural laws that govern all manifested life, not only the outer gross material side of it, but also the spiritual side of it. For spirit and matter are inseparable. Spirit is matter liquidized and matter is spirit crystallized. Spirit is matter in the process of ascending and matter is spirit in the process of descending. And so in that reality that all things are governed by laws, the great teachers have by using the laws accumulated a great wealth of essential philosophy or wisdom or theosophy we may call it or alchemy or uh, the Brahmic essential uh, teachings or the Christian essential teachings, it matters not what name we actually give it. But what it is, is the means by which any human being, whatever color, whatever creed they may be, can attain that which is their ultimate destiny, i.e. union with God imminent in the heart of their own being. And so, how are we actually to attain that? How is it possible to begin the process? I'm sure we all have our attitudes and our opinions of that, and a certain person follows the teachings of the Kabbalah, another person follows the teachings of theosophy, another person follows the teachings of uh, uh, the uh, Jews, uh, exoteric or esoteric, another may follow the uh, Buddhist teachings or the Christian teachings and so on. And each one of them argues that their way is better than everybody else's way. And each one says that I have the whole truth and nothing but the truth and everybody else does not. I have been recently speaking in Greece uh, with uh, some uh, so-called uh, very high priests and uh, they tell me that unless you actually become a Christian then you are lost. And therefore I said it must be that God only uh, loves a few people and the rest of its children it doesn't care about because most of humanity is not Christian. Most of humanity is something other than Christian. He said, well, we don't care about them. We only care about ours, our flock. And so essentially, each one of them has this kind of attitude. However much they like to conceal it on the outside and say that they are open and they really uh, like to integrate and to consider all religions as uh, valuable and uh, of equal standing, each one of them secretly in their hearts uh, harbors or treasures the idea that their religion is the best. And 
That is not to say that each religion does not have the means by which one can attain. But no religion, no doctrine, no particular book, however great and holy it is, can contain the magnificence of truth. For truth is too rich, too immense, too infinite and eternal to be contained in one or other doctrine. It is said by uh, a certain master that many students were told by very wise people that there was a special book. And this special book, when it is found, all knowledge will be known. And so everybody set their feet upon the path and quest of searching for this special book. And when, after a lot of tribulations and after a lot of pain and suffering, climbing mountains, searching in this monastery, searching in that lamasery, and so on, they eventually got to this place, worn out, thin, hungry, with dysentery, malaria, and whatever else they happened to pick up along the way of their journey, what did they find? That the actual book, when they opened it, was just a blank page. There was nothing in it. Absolutely nothing in it. Some were very disappointed. Some committed suicide. Some felt that they were really deceived and that there is no God. All the teachers were false and essentially they might as well just enjoy the pleasures of carnal life and forget all about the journey. But certain, very few, actually became illumined simply by seeing the blank page. They realized what the truth was. And within that truth, out of that pool of wisdom that they touched within themselves, indeed, they were able to pull and express all essential appreciations of the beauty of life, of the goodness of life, and of the truth of life. And so the journey, it is not an outward journey. It is an inward journey. And the blank page is a mirror that actually reflects that inner nature of our own humanness. And it is that which we have to use. There are no special tools that will come from another solar system. There are no special tools that will come from the seventh heaven. There are no special keys that must be given if you are to actually move onwards in your journey of life. What you need, you already actually have. And it is that nature that we need to actually understand. And so the allusions of the base metals, when we speak of uh, uh, the actual gold that we mine in the earth, which is actually tainted by the greed of mankind, veils the gold that can be mined in heaven, which is wisdom. Mercury, which can be wrought out of the rock, is a veil for the, uh, for the mercury that can be uh, mined in space, which means the vapor of adaptability, the mental vapor of adaptability that liberates us from the actual prejudices, from the actual fragmented points of view of I am a Greek, you are an Englishman, you are a Buddhist, I am a Theosophist, you are a Kabbalist, and all the arguments and all the limitations that those fixed points of views actually produce. Certainly there is the lead which is full of weight and there is the lead that is weightless. And this weightless lead allows the human being to practice what's known as levitation. Not levitation that you, know, you hop on your bum, but actually the levitation of consciousness that raises itself from the lower realms to higher realms where it can perceive truth as is. And this kind of levitation may be symbolically called aspiration. And so the lead that is weightless is spiritual aspiration. And it was veiled by the physical lead. There is the corruptible iron and there is the incorruptible iron. The incorruptible iron was a symbol for the divine will in man. And the divine will in man cannot be corrupted by anything, of course. The corruptible iron is desires, and desires are only the shadow or the lower reflection of the divine will. And the desires can be corrupted, but all desires 
lead us either to sorrow or to pain, ultimately, as we have said earlier on. So essentially, what we are talking about is really realizing that within us, we have all and everything that we need for the actual journey of at one man or union with our divine nature. We need to use that which we have in all aspects of ourselves, i.e., we are not only a physical gross material body. And as we have on the whiteboard, I have put the physical nature, the mental nature, the emotional nature, and the volitional nature. All too often in our education, we concentrate on one or other of that. We are concentrating most of the time in our education in turning our nature into a giant computer of memory. And if we have a great memory, then we pass exams. And if we pass exams, then we get great uh, positions of status. And if we have great positions of status, then we can feel boastful that we have really attained something, earn huge amounts of money, and have big zeros behind the number one or two or three, and then feel really proud that we have accumulated and attained something in life. But we do not pay the same degree of attention to our emotional nature. We find scientists that cannot relate with uh, their wives and their uh, children. You have a famous one, and uh, I do not like to mention big names in a derogative sense, because then uh, a person say, oh, look at the pride in him to speak in these ways of a great one. But there is false pride and there is real pride. There is false humility and there is real humility. And it is only one who has true humility that can detect a false pride and a false humility. And therefore, do not be too rash to judge anyone, whether it is your brother or your sister or your friend or the speaker or whoever. And so what I am talking about is essentially that in the example of this great uh, scientist, which is Einstein, you know that Einstein eventually was left he, he, he was left by his wife. And do you know why the reason, uh, what the reason was? Anybody? No? Well, it was, on, it was not only that, but he actually treated her as if she was um, a possession, uh, some material possession that was only there to put food in front of him and uh, uh, to uh, make sure that uh, he was not disturbed when he was uh, his, in his laboratory. And uh, clearly, uh, at no other time did he have any other interest in sharing or uh, interacting with this uh, human being. And so eventually, there was no surprise that she actually left him. There were some more uh, ruder uh, statements that she had made, which are documented in some of the uh, writings of the world. Uh, but I prefer not to go into them. It was just an example to show that you can have on the other extreme artists which uh, uh, are very creative and uh, bring about many beautiful things in their painting or music or uh, whatever art they pursue, but uh, also they are totally useless as far as practical things are concerned and they leave it to their wife or to their husband or to somebody else. This is too far beneath them to actually deal with the practicalities of paying a bill or uh, the practicalities of uh, making sure that the tap is turned off after they have washed their hands, or whatever happened to be the peculiarity of uh, a, a great artist or a great scientist. So it is appropriate and essential that we realize that unless we work with our physical, emotional, volitional, and mental natures and bring about a balance and a harmony in that, the actual journey will only be prolonged and the actual sorrow will only be increased because the imbalances will bring about various kinds of conflicts and diseases. And I will go on to explain a little bit more of how that uh, happens. The ancient Greeks gave to these four aspects of man symbolically the four elements, the earth, air, fire, and water. And many other teachers took on board that uh, uh, particular key or uh, way and used it, such as Jung and various others, Plato and, and so on. However, the four conditions of matter do not only 
represent those four elements that we are talking about, but they represent the four conditions of all matter in the manifested universe. Scientists may have found more than 140 elements, but the ancients knew only of one element, which they called Aether, and out of that one element, all and everything else manifested in those four conditions. And so one of the exercises perhaps you can do is to look at all the 140 elements or more that they may have found and they may continue to discover more and then endeavor to place them under the four conditions of earth, air, fire and water, which means solids, liquids, gases and igneous substances. And you'll find that all of these elements will fall in one or other of these conditions. You may, as an example, begin with oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, and carbon. You will, you will find that carbon will go with earth. You will find that nitrogen will go with fire, hydrogen with water, and oxygen with air. And so you can go on and do the same with all of these elements. But that is only the beginning to familiarize and to turn your consciousness to the reality that these four conditions exist in the world whether we are Greeks, whether we are English, whether we are Buddhists, no matter what we are. The Kabbalists, they call them the four realms or the four worlds. The world of emanations, the world of creations, the world of formations and the world of actions. And symbolically, they are also represented by these four elements. And so, what we have to use is these four aspects of our nature, the key of the four conditions of all matter, and then reflect upon the reality that if we are to build a temple, an inner temple in ourselves, so that within that inner temple the divine God immanent can consciously dwell, then we must ask the question, what is that inner temple, which symbolically we call inner temple, in a real sense, so that we can get to engage with it and work with it. That inner temple we call it character. And so we must observe our own character and find out its constitution. Our character contains within it positive qualities and negative qualities. To use a better term, I will say appropriate qualities and inappropriate qualities. For there can be positive qualities and negative qualities that are appropriate. And positive qualities and negative qualities that are inappropriate. And appropriate and inappropriateness refers to purpose. And if the purpose is self-realization, then to bring about that purpose in actualization, then we need to know the self. And to know the self, where do we begin? We begin at investigating our character. And so in the same way, as a builder, make sure that he has the right measure of earth, air, and water, and fire to produce his bricks, which he uses to build his building or his uh, physical temple. So it is with the spiritual alchemist. He must use the right measure of these elements if he is to bring about a balanced and correct character or inner temple within which his divine God imminent may dwell. Essentially, this is very, very important because if you have too much earth element, then you produce constipation in yourself. If you have too much water element, you produce diarrhea in yourself in the physical sense or verbal mental diarrhea in the mental sense, yes? And so essentially, you may laugh, but the truth is that we have to reflect upon our psychological nature and see what kind of qualities it's made up with. What is its makeup? And take a list and write on one side all the appropriate qualities towards one's purpose, which is self-realization, attainment of oneness. And on the other side, write all those qualities which are the inappropriate qualities. Having done that list, then you can begin the next step of actually placing them under the four elements of fire, water, air, and earth. As we have begun there with the physical aspects of our nature. And then after that step is the third step of actually putting those qualities in terms of physical, mental, emotional, and volitional. 
As an example, as far as Earth is concerned, the quality of the Earth element is to give stability, to give integrity. And so you will put stability and integrity in one of the other aspects of your nature. In the physical sense, you're talking about good nutrition or regu regularity of bowel movement. But in the negative sense, it's malnutrition and constipation. In the air, you have buoyancy and good respiration or poor respiration, which means breathing or bad breathing. And I tell you, you may laugh, but a great deal of diseases would not be within our human bodies if we breathed more appropriately. The government can save enormous amount of money if they invested in teaching the teachers of young children appropriate means and ways of how to instruct children to breathe properly. Most of us breathe in this upper chest and so we only use a very small part of the chest and we use a very small part of the goodness that is contained with the air that we breathe because we do not only breathe air but we breathe also the vitality that the air is a vehicle for into ourselves. And so essentially appropriate breathing is very important if we are to maintain good health. Appropriate diet is very important to maintain good health and certainly this is on the physical sense but on the mental and emotional sense we have to reflect of all the different qualities such as as I mentioned compassion, love, humility and the negative sense of pride, of jealousy, of hate, of fear, of vanity and see where they actually belong in terms of the four elements and where they belong in terms of the physical, mental, emotional and volitional nature. When we have these mirrors very clearly in terms of positive and negative or appropriate and inappropriate qualities then we will see where we stand. Because I tell you, if you ever have tried to go from one place to another and you find yourself you are lost, yes, to find the map and to find the way to get to where you want to go, first of all you've got to find out where you are. And until you find where you are, you can't get anywhere. And if that is true in terms of the simplicity of getting from A to B on a map, then it is also true for the simplicity of getting from the state of being not in control of your vehicles. Who can put their hands in their heart and say they are utterly in control of their mind, their emotions, their body, their passions and so on? Can anybody? I take it then that we are all in need of some alchemy <laughs> and some learning <laughs> and some transmutation and transformation, yes? So clearly, if we are constantly swinging from one mood into another, if we are constantly finding uh, ourselves arguing with friends or colleagues or people of different nationality, of different religious background or different ideology, then we must reflect upon our character and our nature and there we will find that we have certain attachments, we have certain kinds of uh, uh, prejudices and we must begin the process of transmutation and transformation. Essentially, a lot of various teachers and various books, when it comes to saying what a person must do to attain the higher life, they suggest killing the lower passions, they suggest suppression, they suggest that avoidance, but the spiritual alchemy teachings suggest nothing of those things. They suggest something that is far more in harmony with the natural laws that govern all and everything. They suggest that any work that we do must be under the law of economy and it must use all and everything that is available. And it is not possible to actually have the philosopher's stone, which means the union of the whole self, if a fragment of it is actually killed or uh, su suppressed or avoided or imprisoned. You must have the whole self if you are to have the Philosopher's Stone. So that means that our raw materials, in the same way we have learned how to harness them in the earth and in nature and produce beautiful things to serve our, our purpose, to create the buildings, to create all these wonderful things that make our lives more comfortable, in the same way that we have attained that task, 
we must also attain the task of harnessing the raw materials in our own nature. The same way that we have learned how to tame the wild beasts of the jungle, we must learn how to tame the wild beasts with our own inner jungle. The wild beasts such as the horse, which symbolically in biblical terms and in various other symbolic writings represents uh, desires and passions, has been domesticated, and this domesticated horse is a very good companion of human beings, assists them and serves them. The domesticated horse in, uh, in inner terms means the actual spiritual aspirations, the symbol of which is the unicorn, which is a symbol of the spiritual soul qualities. Or you have the dog that has been a very loyal and is a very loyal friend of man and woman, and the dog symbolically represents attachments. Now, all our attachments must be transmuted into appropriate loyalties instead of attachments which create conflicts with another person who has different types of attachments. And so, in the same way that symbolically, in the Christian times, the Christ was born in a cave, in the major surrounded by domesticated animals, because if they were wild beasts, they would devour the newborn child immediately. In that same way, we must realize that the higher God imminent consciousness cannot fully manifest in the heart, i.e. in our being, in our personality, unless that personality actually tames these wild beasts so that the newborn, the arising of that Christ consciousness, the love wisdom consciousness as it might otherwise be called, will not be consumed by the lower passions, by the lower beasts, by these vapors of uh, vitriolic poison, as we may call them. I tell you, if we were ever able to see what lies in the aura of human beings, we'll be more horrified than actually walking through the jungle with all the wailing of the beasts and all the, the howling of the wolves and the hyenas and so on. These expressions of emotions and passions that we have immediately take a certain kind of form in our aura and is projected towards the person to whom we are sending that passion or that emotion or that jealousy or that hate, whatever we may call it. And these forms take the shape of appropriately to the quality of the energy that is being expressed. And some of the quality of energy that is present in hate, in uh, jealousy, in uh, anger, in rage, and so on, are very, very monstrous kind. And sometimes you can perceive that when people are arguing very heavily and you walk into the room, you really feel the atmosphere and the pressure and you feel the threatening atmosphere that is there. And so essentially, these wild beasts is not only an allegory. They do really exist in our own nature. And they require taming. They do not require killing. They require really education and teaching. And this is what spiritual alchemy is all about. It's taking the raw materials and transmuting them into their higher counterparts. And so, let us take a few examples and see how that may be done. I often have used a, a, a very uh, simple simile because it conveys the appropriate truth of it. On the one hand, if we go down to a swamp, we will find that there is an inappropriate scent not very pleasant. But if we go into a spring, then there is a freshness and there is life in abundance there. And so there is a different nature to the swamp and there is a different nature to the spring. There is a different nature to the personality and there is a different nature to spirituality. Spirituality is selfless, it's all giving, it's always in abundance of love and compassion and selflessness. Personality always wants for itself. So if we take some muddy substance, i.e. some aspects of the personality, 
and then we take it into our laboratory. This laboratory is our vehicles, our nature, our physical, mental, emotional, and volitional nature. And then we apply a higher agent upon this muddy substance. Then we have the miracle that occurs. If we put the muddy substance in one container, link into another container, apply fire to it, then we have the water evaporating, trickling, and there is the clear crystal water and the clear crystal earth. The nasty scent or smell has disappeared. So the muddy condition is no longer there. Where did it go? Is there a special place in the universe where all, forgive me the shit, goes uh, that we create? Have I said the root word? Is it inappropriate? <laughs> so, essentially, this is the simplicity of what needs to be done. That we bring about this separation of those qualities that are inappropriate for us. They may have served us in the past. They may have fulfilled their useful purpose. But now it is time that those ingredients that are locked up in that condition are separated into their natural constituents and then they may re be re-blended in an appropriate way with greater wisdom that we have accumulated so that it can serve us well, so that it can serve us in a purposeful way. In the same way that that water and that earth that has remained from the muddy condition can be re-blended and you can produce a nice uh, plate upon which to put your um, food and eat for your body to have good health, or a beautiful vase to put flowers. And so, in that same way, we must transmute and transform some of those base qualities. And the way of doing it is not by killing them, as we said, is not by condemning them, is not by suppressing them, is not by indulging in them. Some people suggest that if you indulge enough in a particular quality, eventually, you would actually get bored with it, and then you will grow out of it. But the fact of the matter is that you have built such a powerful elemental, as it is known, while you were indulging in it. In other words, you have invested so much of yourself in it that when you are bored from it, it may allow you to think that it is no longer alive, it's no longer there, it is dead. But the serpent, I tell you, is only asleep. It has been too fat with lots of food, and so it fell asleep for a while. And when hunger begins in its belly, it will wake up and it will be hissing and it will have you for breakfast. <laughs> Indeed, it will. And so, be aware that such suggestions of indulging in it because you will become bored and then you will give it up, it is not an appropriate way of dealing with these uh, uh, lower emotions. A more appropriate way is to follow the natural means by which a gardener works miracles in his garden. When he has a very strong, healthy tree that produces bitter fruit, bitter cherries, and he also has in his garden a cherry tree that produces sweet cherries, then what he does is at the appropriate time takes a branch from that tree and grafts it on the tree that has very strong roots and therefore then this strength that draws raw materials travels all the way up to that branch that has been grafted upon it, and it continues to produce then sweet fruit. So in the same way, we must not deny the strong roots of our bitter nature. We must actually use them. We must use everything that we have in accordance with the law of economy. Use the minimum amount of energy to produce the maximum result. That is the law of economy. Harmlessly so. Yes? And so the law of harmlessness must govern our attitude in respect of that. And so, if we take some of these qualities, such as pride and fear and vanity, and trying to see how we may bring about this transmutation, how much time have I got? A few more minutes, yes? Okay. What we will do? What is pride? Anyone? Sense of superiority, yeah? I tell you that pride is something 
that many people believe they can get rid of very, very easily. Pride sticks with you all the way to the mountaintop. Even great ones have fallen from the mountaintop because of pride. And there is a biblical story about that. It is said that Lucifer was one of the greatest, the brightest, the highest archangels. But then, because that produced pride, he said that I am like God, and therefore he endeavored to dethrone God and take on the station of God. And then Michael challenged and said, who is like God? And God, it is said in the story, made Michael the guardian and protector of all the righteous. And Lucifer became the fallen angel. Of course, there is a deeper meaning into that, which perhaps some other time we can go into it. But essentially, it does convey the message to us that pride is a very essential part of our nature, and it sticks with us all the way right up to the mountaintop, and it requires continuous vigilance and continuous transmutation and transformation before we are able to succeed in transforming it and transmuting it into its higher counterpart, which is humility. Many people manifest apparently humility. A person who is very poor in front of his uh, boss, who is very rich and powerful, he's always groveling and pretending that he's actually got a lot of humility in front of his boss. But you give that person a bit of authority, a bit of money, and a bit of power, and you soon discover how much humility he has. He probably will be a greater tyrant than he boss, that his boss is. And so, very often, what appears as humility is not true humility. Pride is a way of looking. And this is the key of actually altering the dynamic in us that transmutes things of a lower order into their higher counterpart. If we always look to things that are lower than ourselves, that are below ourselves, that are smaller than ourselves, then of course, naturally, we will get the impression that we are so big and so great and so uh, powerful that pride will be the natural manifestation of that vision. But if we also turn our attention in the exact opposite direction and begin to look towards the greatness of things, the, the words of the all-magnificence of the whole of creation, then in the face of that magnificence, then clearly we might begin to feel very small indeed and begin to have degrees of that essential quality of humility. So it is a way of looking that determines whether you will invest in pride or you will invest in humility. Humility is like the reality of... Uh, a real flower. It has a scent about it, and you know it when a person is truly humble, in the same way that you know that a real flower uplifts you with its scent, whereas a plastic flower, it has no scent. So it is the same with a false humility. It has no that scent of genuineness in it. And so the way to transmute pride slowly is to constantly reflect about the greatness of the cosmos, about the greatness of those that have gone before you, and to acknowledge the debt that we have for those that have come before us and dedicated their life to all that we now benefit from, whether it is in the material sense or in the spiritual sense. For no teacher gives a new message without that message having its roots in all that has come before it. All teachings, even the great one of Christ, the teaching of the Christ, you will find that it has also its roots in the earlier teachings of the Greeks, the Hebrews, the Egyptians, the Hindus, the Buddhists, and so on. So we must pay our respect to the greatness of all that has come before us, to the greatness of all that exists in the universe. It is true that we cannot really warm ourselves in a cold night unless we give up the attachment to the wood that is not right next to us. We must sacrifice the wood 
and throw it into the fire if we want to have heat. We must sacrifice the attachment of holding onto the liquid of oil if we want to have light so that we may enjoy our reading. And so in the same way, if we want to enjoy the greater aspects of the spiritual life, the freedom, the greater responsiveness, the greater abilities and faculties that come with that, then we must be prepared to joyfully sacrifice those lower elements by using them as raw materials to cultivate and unfold these higher qualities. Joyful sacrifice is the most powerful key to the transmutation and transformation of our lower nature into our higher counterpart and thereby transmute and transform ourselves into a fit instrument, into a fit vehicle for the divine inherent potentiality in us to actualize itself in our everyday life. And this begins when the personality turns its attention from the trivialities of everyday life the gossiping, the uh, various little chit-chats about this and about that, and takes a deep interest in its own nature, in its own self-cultivation, in its neighbor's well-being, in its children's well-being, in its other younger nation's well-being, if we are talking in terms of nations and governments. For the same rules apply to the individual as well as to the group. The same qualities that an individual is endeavoring to cultivate, groups, nations must also learn to cultivate. And so fear, another quality. How do we actually overcome fear? Fear paralyzes. There are three powerful ways that we can overcome fear. One of them is by the use of the will. Another is by the use of love, wisdom. And the other is by the use of intelligence. So what we fear, when we know how to overcome it, when we have the knowledge, then we no longer fear it, yes? If I have a bill to pay and I have the power to pay, then I don't fear it. If I don't have the power, then I fear it, yes? If I am in love with someone and this someone is across a dangerous ground, it may be a graveyard and a girl is afraid of graveyards, but she's in love with a boy on the other side. That love will give her the courage to walk through the graveyard and meet her beloved one. But in the absence of love, then the fear reigns supreme. And so through the power of the will, through love and through knowledge, we overcome fear. Do you know that fear is really just a, a phenomena of uh, the secretion of uh, um, your adrenals? Yes? On one hand, the adrenals secrete a substance and that produces adrenaline and uh, it produces this uh, vigor and anger. And on the other hand, there is uh, a part of the adrenals that produces uh, that uh, uh, which is the phenomena of fear. So if you were able to know how to control the appropriate secretion in that gland, you can actually overcome the fear, minimize the fear, and maximize the courage. It is said by various uh, uh, eminent uh, doctors that all our glands govern our personality. And indeed, that is true. But the glands are governed by the centers of energy which stimulate the glands. The glands secrete certain substances and those substances stimulate the organs and so the function of our bodies goes on. But the centers of energy are governed by you. You are the entity that occupies, and these centers of energy are the eyes of you, the spiritual soul, that is the rightful tenant and the rightful user of those instruments. And so, by means of grafting and by means of using your appropriate will, your appropriate love, wisdom, and intelligence, you can begin the transformation of your physical, mental, emotional, and volitional nature. But the beginning lies in making those lists, which does not mean only an intellectual list of sitting down, making all of these qualities on one side and all the other qualities on the other side and say, well, I've done it now. But you have to observe yourself in everyday living. You have to observe yourself in your relationships, in your interactions. You have to observe yourself in all of these everyday happenings 
and see what kind of qualities you actually express and whether they are appropriate or inappropriate for the next step in the ladder of evolution. And if you find them to be inappropriate, then you must apply the appropriate knowledge and use of the will and the use of your love for your ultimate goal to bring about the transmutation and transformation of them. I hope that in what I have said, I have given a sense of what this allegorical meaning of alchemy is all about. It is really the whole quest of transmuting and transforming our nature into a magnificent, architecturally built instrument that can be more responsive for the inner divine nature, the inner divine self. For we must unfold the inherent potentiality and at the same time refine and train and develop the form through which it can manifest itself. You cannot have a very high advanced consciousness using a very low dense instrument. It cannot manifest its greatness. So both must happen. And so bothing is the means by which we can bring about spiritual alchemy. So I now have finished my talk, and it's your turn if you want to ask any questions. Yes? Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. I'm sure you've just begun many minds turning very rapidly. We'll give them 60 seconds to recover their composure. Yanis, in the light of fear, Yes. Um, that's where Job said, when he had all these precious and boys and physicality, is it not that when he said, what I have feared has come from you? Job. Job, yes. yes. That's what he said. Yeah. What I have feared has come from you. Mm -hmm. Did you all hear the Correct. question? Correct. Correct. No, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. In the light of fear, that's where Job, in the book of Job, when he had all these illnesses, all these boils, and all these discharges upon his skin, he said, what I have feared has come upon me. Yeah. Just as with the line of the physicality and adrenaline. Yes, correct. Understand. Yeah. Well, clearly, uh, what we misunderstand is the reality that the various diseases that we suffer from are not inflictions that are sent by God to punish us. They are not, uh, there is no some kind of fintish God sitting up there in the heavens looking down upon us and say, oh, he looks like he needs a dose of, uh, uh, of uh, he, looks, he looks like he needs a dose of, of uh, cancer, or he needs a dose of uh, um, malaria. malaria, thank you, or whatever else might need. It actually happens simply by the way we live our lives. Certain psychological qualities, if they are persisted, eventually manifest in the physical realm as actual diseases because the physical is not separate from the psychological. One affects the other and thereby if you have a vibration of an intellectual nature that is corruptible or it is corrosive, then eventually it will also corrode your physical nature. And so a person who is a hoarder in one form or another, or too structured in their thinking, will eventually, if they persist, produce physical manifestation of that which we might call constipation. And so all of the different diseases, in one form or another, have their root in the etheric double of the human being or in the psychological nature, mostly in the passionate nature, i.e. the lower emotions. Yeah? So, any other question before? Yeah. You talk about um, the ways of overcoming your sort of negative aspects. Yeah. <coughs> and you were saying the different, the different ways that were inappropriate. Yeah. Which was indulgence. In yes, the, correct. And how you grow this sort of uh, massive... Uh, Elemental, Elemental. <laughs> yes. So once you've actually grown one of these, that's massive. <laughs> <laughs> what do yes. you do about it then? <laughs> once you realize... Yes. Speaking from personal <laughs> <laughs> well, the first step to do is to really objectify it, to actually see that this habit uh, is not uh, anything other than uh, uh, a, a, an independent now child that you have given birth to. 
And this child requires, first of all, if it is unruly, some kind of education and given the chance to alter its attitude. But if you find that this child is absolutely not interested in education, if you find that this child certainly can no longer serve your next step in purpose, then you must withdraw your investment from it. You withdraw your interest from it. You know, when you have an interest in something, you keep investing energy in it. When you withdraw your investment and your interest, it means to withdraw that aspect of yourself which is lost or incorporated within it or enclosed, imprisoned within that elemental. Yes. When you withdraw that, then it no longer receives its food. So when an unruly child does not receive its allowance, then it begins to listen. Do you follow what I'm saying? It begins to listen because it needs its allowance to do its thing. So then it begins to become open to education. By withdrawing your interest from continuing a particular habit, then it begins to diminish in strength and in power. Then you can break down the actual empty form and dissolve the materials into their constituent elements, as I have said. But until you withdraw that interest, that aspect of yourself that is involved in it, if, you still have a, if a part of you still has an interest in it, and the other part is saying, I want to give it up, or I want to stop it, then there is an argument. There is a, a powerful conflict. And the conflict only produces more conflict of its kind. So what is necessary is, first of all, to objectify, to look at it directly, to not avoid it, to not condemn it, to see it for what it is, and to realize, powerfully so, that that no longer needs to be continued. It is the realization of that that will make the effort effortless in actually withdrawing from it your investment. If you don't invest in that realization, then constantly it will be a process of argument. Sometimes it will succeed, sometimes you will succeed, because a part of you is still there. You cannot destroy it unless you withdraw that part. Otherwise, you will be trying to destroy a part of you, and you can never succeed in doing that. Yes? So when you're saying, the, um, you're saying like that it, uh, it only gets to sleep if you only feed it in a, in a natural yeah. Uh, yeah. terms. Um, because that part of you is still in there. You have not withdrawn it. This is the important thing. People say, let us practice positive thinking. Yes? And they say, or, or uh, let us practice this thing of saying, I will have, I will have, I will have, and then I will, uh, eventually I will have. But the point is that that is based on a false premise because it is based on the premise that I am without and someday if I say enough times I will have patience, I will have patience. You know, affirmations is what I'm talking about. But affirmations can only work when you realize that you are the source of the energy that actually builds that which you choose to build. It is not simply the repetition. It is not simply saying a thousand times that you will have patience. But investing the energy out of the source that you are in the quality and expressing it, living it, in a, then manifests it. You follow? So it is you that is the source. If you are the source of the energy, the law says that energy follows thought. That which you think about consciously you eventually energize and build. If you withdraw that energization, then that building breaks down in the same way that your body breaks down and dissolves into the elements when the vitality is withdrawn from it, which is the soul. When the soul is withdrawn from the body, the body becomes rigor mortis, turns into the actual earth, the liquid falls out of it, and it turns into 10 pounds worth of chemicals and 10 gallons of water that it's made out of. Yeah? So it's the same thing with psychological qualities. When the energy is withdrawn from it, then the material, the form, begins to dissolve and break down. Then that material can be reused to build another form that is more appropriate. Is that clear? So you can ignore it. Ignoring things ignoring no, first of all, objectifying it directly, not condemning it, not indulging it, seeing that it is totally inappropriate for the next step in your evolution, and thereby withdrawing your interest from it, consciously saying, I now withdraw that aspect of myself that is 
involved and lost in that elemental, and I will no longer invest in it. And then using the power of your will to ensure that that is the case, and knowing that the will cannot be beaten. Yes? Desire can, but the divine will is all-powerful within you insofar as these elementals are concerned. And the way to do it is to maximize the power of the will and minimize the power of that elemental. The elemental is not even a human being yet. It's not even a mineral. And you will allow that little mineral to have greater power over you, the divine will. It only has greater power when you think you're just little you and it is this great powerful thing that you have invested so much in. Yes? But when you reverse the roles, it's a way of looking, as I said, with pride, yes? That alters the dynamic in you. But it must be a conscious withdrawal. That is very, very important. Otherwise, you will be fighting with another fragment of yourself. And essentially, finding the philosopher's stone is withdrawing all those fragments of the self lost in the various elementals, qualities, thought forms, whatever we might call them, into one cohesive whole. And knowing that truly... That is the source of all and everything. Then you don't need this quality or that quality, for you can express at will the appropriate quality as it is needed, when it is needed. A master does not have a big computer in his head saying passion, compassion, love, humility, and all of these qualities. He does not live with this you know, swelling thing. He simply is himself, wholly so. And out of that, when he sees the crying of a child, compassion flows naturally so. Yes? It is not like a calculated uh, thing, like we are going to say, I'm going to be patient. Be patient. Be patient. Don't be irritated. Don't be irritated. Don't be irritated. <laughs> okay? So, yeah. Yeah. Well, there are intermediate stages. See, an advanced master, I'm sure, does not suffer of the kind of diseases that an ordinary human being like you and I may do. But an intermediate stages between the ordinary human being and the master may suffer from one kind or other of disease. And then there is also this other uh, state where a human being, due to his compassion, he may not yet be a master, but he is a student of one of the masters. And he may say that my sister, at this present moment in time, her personality cannot really effectively handle this particular disease that she's suffering from. Let me share, let me alleviate part of that. In the same way, like a good-mannered boy will help an old woman with her luggage to cross the road. In that same way, a more advanced student of a master may help a person who may suffer from a particular disease. That may be called the sharing of the karma. In the same way that an elder brother shares the karma of a younger brother in a family, so it is an elder brother, in terms of a spiritual ladder of evolution, may share partially a part of the karma. It doesn't mean that that is grace. It simply means that they are helping them, educating them how to deal with it themselves, and when the personality is ready, then they can deal with it. Or they may deal with it in some other way. In being helped in the disease and being healed, they may now so be inspired to give greater service to humanity and look after many children that are homeless and uh, parentless and so on. So there are these intermediate s stages, yeah? So your answer is, no, not all spiritual people uh, are free of diseases, yes? They may have, because what may be 90% for us for an advanced spiritual student, the 10% is as powerful to him that he has not yet transmuted as the 90% is for us. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah? Sometimes you may find quite an advanced human being who has not only spiritual qualities of compassion and love, but also faculties, psychic faculties unfolded to a very high precision status, yet he has some imperfection. Now, because of our stupid mentality where we want to project on human beings, if they appear to be good teachers, the perfect godhood, if we discover subsequently that they have a bit of human imperfection, then we devalue 
everything that they have taught, everything they have spoken about, everything that they have given to the world. We do not appropriately see the reality that they have given abundance, they give selflessly abundance, but yet there is a 5% or a 10% that as yet has not been transmuted. So do not look, if you are thirsty, always, whether the water that you are drinking and you are being offered comes from a cup that is like a goblet or a cup that is Greek or a cup that is actually Chinese or uh, Japanese. Be grateful that you have been given some water to drink no matter what the cup is, even if it is apparently not as beautifully designed as you would like it to be. Yes? I have heard, you laugh, but I have heard of a particular person, well, he had a big nose, didn't he? What do you expect from a person that has a big nose? Meaning to say that, well, you know, we always knew that really he would fall somewhere, wouldn't he? Yes? And so, essentially, we use sometimes uh, the the design of the outer form to to justify our uh, decisions and our behavior. We must grow up and stop dealing with each other in these rather moronic ways. And we laugh, but we can catch ourselves if we are vigilant and observant, being moronic, even with our loved ones. How many of us argue on the one moment we say to our loved one, I really love you, I really love you. You are the best thing that happened to me. And then, because they manifest a bit of their imperfection, then we shout at them and say, "Ah!" So, clearly, we have work to do. Spiritual alchemy to practice. Yes? One more, and we've got to go. Okay, we've got to go. Who's it going to be? One more. How do you overcome greed? Well, that's a big one. <laughs> Leave a hundred pounds. <laughs> do you know how, what I did once? <laughs> Some of the people that have suffered the consequence are actually present. I said to people, take a five pound note and put it in the air, show it to, to me. And I went and collected all the five pound notes you should have seen the sense of hmm, loss. loss. Ah, loss, five pound note. Hmm, what is it for? We are always so attached to the material side of money. And so this greed mostly is focused on money at present, but money is the symbol of creativity. And this greed comes from the illusion that we are not the source of all and everything that we need. Greed is a phenomena of this psychological uh, disease that we call mourners. Mourners, yes? Comes out of the base chakra, the programming of the base chakra center. The base chakra deals with security and insecurity. No matter how much security on the physical plane you have, you will never have enough. You will always need more. I mean the security of so many millions in your bank account, the security of having the most beautiful uh, husband or wife, the security of having the most high status in your particular field, the best painting that you have made if you are an artist, the best music and so on. If and for as long that your security comes from the outer form of life, then you will always have the phenomena of greed manifesting in you. Only the moment that you realize that you cannot find security in that which is temporary, you cannot find the ultimate moreness. How much is the ultimate moreness? How much more is going to be enough? Huh? When you realize that there is never going to be enough insofar as that outer form that can give you security, then you begin to realize that the only security lies in the innermost self that is not transient to the outer conditions and environmental changes. And so greed begins to diffuse and lose lose its power over you. But until such time as that realization dawns in our consciousness, greed will govern us. And those that say they are not greedy and they are very generous, probably they are the most greedy. Lots of spiritual people 
say they are not greedy, they are so generous. But you demonstrate that a person is a master and they will push you out of the way to get closer to the master <laughs> the fastest that you can possibly think. Is that not greed? I think it is. So, little one, he's my boss. 29, 28, 27, carry on. Why does Fernando Rasti, at some point in the secret negotiation, think of that God can maneuver through a frail being? Cigar? No. Fernando Rasti. Yes, said. Yes. A God. Yes. The Lord. Yes, the Lord. Through, uh, through a frail person yeah. in him to yes. have somebody that is constant. Yeah, well, that is exactly the same way uh, as the Christ saying, the meek shall inherit the, the heaven, and uh, saying that uh, those that uh, uh, have uh, not shall have, etc., etc. It's the same principle. It's talking about this principle of sacrifice is the key to all transmutation and transformation. What are we to sacrifice? Sacrifice, I said, the wood, the oil. Sacrifice our lower natures, the raw materials of that, to have the life more abundant that the Christ has spoken of. That is what Blavansky was suggesting in that meaning. That the frailty of the boastfulness of how much you have attained as a personality, when you realize that in the face of the cosmic divine wisdom that unveils this universal magnificence is minute. As the, as the great teacher Socrates says, the more I know, the more I realize how much I really don't know. So that is what Madhav Blavatsky was suggesting in that, yes? The frailty of the personality. Yes, sure. I'm sure you knew it because you know all and everything. As Plato said, it is remembrance. Thank you. All the very best to all of you. In thank you for really listening to me. In a moment, we'll give you some uh, notices, but uh, now I would like to thank Yanis for another usually well-delivered <laughs> talk on a most profound subject, but tonight at a super-octane level. <laughs> thank you very much.